The BBC presents The Sign of Four, a Sherlock Holmes story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for radio in five episodes by Felix Felton. The story is told by Sherlock Holmes' friend and assistant, Dr. Watson. Episode three, The Trail of the Wooden-Legged Man. Good day to you. At his house in South London, Mr. Thaddeus Sholto told us of his father's terror of wooden-legged men and how, on his deathbed, the father had confessed to withholding from Miss Mary Morstan her rightful share of the great Agra treasure. Startled by seeing a wild-looking man peering through the window, he had died without revealing the whereabouts of the treasure. But now, said Mr. Sholto... It had been found by his twin brother, Bartholomew, in a secret attic of his home. We went with Mr. Sholto to his brother's house and found the brother sitting dead and twisted in a chair. A small thorn was sticking in his head just behind the ear. And by his side was a note which read, The Sign of the Fall. We were still examining the dead man, when we heard a wail from Mr. Thaddeus Sholto. Oh, Mr. Holmes, the treasure, it's gone. Gone? Are you certain? Of course I am. We, we lowered it down together, and I was the last person here. You, you you, don't think I did it, do you? I swear I didn't. Calm yourself, Mr. Sholto. You were not the last person here. Look there on the floor by the table. Huh? Do you see it? A small circular disc of mud. Well, what does that tell us? It's not a footmark. No, but it's something much more valuable to us. The impression of a wooden stump. You mean... I mean, Mr. Sholto, the wooden-legged man has been here. Look, there it is again, and there by the window. But how could he get into this room? I mean, the door was locked, and we're three floors up. That we have to discover. Your first duty, Mr. Sholto, is to drive down to the station and report the matter to the police. Oh, oh I can't do that. They'll suspect me. They'll, they'll think I had a hand. You have it. nothing to fear. Go to the police and offer to assist them in every way. But Please, I... Mr. Sholto, you urge your brother. Dr. Watson and I will wait here until you return. Oh, very well, if you say so. Oh, merciful heavens, what a terrible business. I shall never survive it. Now, Watson, we have half an hour to ourselves. Let us make good use of it. My case is almost complete. Almost complete? Yes, but we mustn't err on the side of overconfidence. Simple as it seems, there may be something deeper underlying it. I'm glad you find it simple. I don't. Just sit in the corner there so that your footprints don't complicate matters. Huh? Oh. Oh, Now to work. How did Timbertoe get in here? The door was locked, that we know. The window? Oh, it slipped on the inner side. Hmm. Framework solid. No hinges at the side. Let's open it. No water pipe near. Roof quite out of reach. Ah, come and look, Watson. Mm. There's the print of a foot in mould on the sill. It did rain a bit, you remember? Yeah, and there's another of those muddy circles. Quite so. But there was someone else, a very able and efficient ally. Oh, I don't... Look down, Doctor, below you. Could you scale that wall? My hat, no. It must be 60 feet from the ground, and I I can't see a foothold or even a crevice in it anywhere. Oh, no, it's impossible. Without help, yes. But suppose you had a friend up here who lured you that good stout rope I see in the corner, fastening one end to this great hook in the wall. You could swarm up then, wooden leg and all. And I suppose he left the same way. And then whoever it was up here drew up the rope and shut the window. That's it. As a minor point, we may note that our wooden-legged friend was not a professional sailor. Why not? His hands were far from being horny. There's more than one blood mark on this rope. He must have slipped down so fast that he took the skin off his palm. That's all very well, but what about this mysterious friend? How did he get in? Or out, for that matter? Hmm, the friend. Yes, he's rather interesting. He lifts the case from the regions of the commonplace, though parallel cases suggest themselves from India. Possibly, but how did he get in? The door's locked? The window's inaccessible? (laughs) Did he come down the chimney? No, the grate's too small. I thought of that. Well, how then? Oh, Watson, you will not apply my precepts. What 
Princess. How often have I told you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. He didn't come by the door, the window, or the chimney, so... Well, he must have come through the hole in the ceiling. That's it. He came by the secret attic in which the treasure was found. We'd better get up there and see what we can find. Holmes mounted a chair and, seizing a rafter in either hand, swung himself with incredible agility up into the garret. Then, lying on his face, he reached down for the lamp and held it while I followed him as best I could. The garret was about ten feet one way and six the other. The roof ran up to an apex and was evidently the inner shell of the true roof of the house. There was no furniture of any sort and the accumulated dust of years lay on the floor. Ah, careful where you tread, it's only thin plaster between the rafters. Yes. Ah, here you are, you see. There's a trap door in the sloping wall that must lead out onto the roof. From there, no doubt, our agile friend would find easy access to the ground. <coughs> yes, the trap opens quite easily. That's how number one entered. Well, let's see if we can find any other traces of him. Oh, yes, there we are. <gasps> Splendid footprint. See? The perfect impression of a naked foot. But Holmes, it's so small. Can it be that a child has done this awful thing? No, not a child. I was staggered myself for a moment, but the thing's quite natural. My memory failed me, or I should have been able to foretell it. What does it mean? Oh, my dear Watson, try a little analysis yourself. You know my methods. Apply them. I can't think of anything that would cover the facts. Well, it'll be clear to you soon enough. Mm, there's nothing more to be learned here, as far as I can see. But I'll take a closer look. Holmes moved about the room with his lens and a tape measure, comparing and examining. His long, thin nose only a few inches from the floor. His movements were swift, silent and furtive, like those of a bloodhound picking out a scent. And I couldn't help thinking what a terrible criminal he would have made had he turned his energies against the law instead of in its defence. Finally, he gave a little crow of delight and swung himself down into the room below. Ah! Whither I followed him. We're certainly in luck, Watson. We ought to have very little trouble now. Why? What have you found? You see that table with the Bunsen burners and retorts? Evidently, our friend Bartholomew was a bit of a chemist. Down beside it, there are some carboys of acid in wicker baskets, and one of them's either leaking or got broken. Yeah. Mm, you can smell it in the air. Creosote. And number one had the misfortune to tread in it with his bare foot. There were traces of it upstairs. How does that help us? Why, we've got him, that's all. I know a dog that would follow that scent to the world's end. If a pack can track a trailed herring across a shire, how far can a specially trained animal follow a smell like this? <laughs> it sounds like a sum in the rule of three, and the answer should give us the view halloo. Ah, here are the representatives of the law. Before they come, just look at this poor fellow in the chair again. Feel his muscles. Mm, hard as a board. Quite so, in a state of extreme contraction. Then there's the distortion of the face, this Hippocratic smile, or risus sardonicus, as the old writers called it. What conclusion would you come to? Death from some powerful vegetable alkaloid. Some substance like strychnine, which would produce tetanus. Exactly. Now, look at this thorn that we found in his head. Careful with it. There's some gummy stuff on the end. Is it an English thorn? No, <laughs> it certainly isn't. Well, there you are, then. Right, ah, but here are the regulars. There you are, Inspector. Well, here's a pretty business. Who are all these people? The house seems as full as a rabbit warren. I think you must remember me, Mr. Athelney Jones. Why, of course I do. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. <laughs> remember you. I'll never forget how you lectured us all on causes and effects in the Bishopsgate jewel case. I set you on the right track. More by good luck than good guidance. It was a piece of very simple reasoning. Oh, come now, come. Never be ashamed to own up. Well, now, what's all this, sir? Hmm? Oh, dear, 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 dear. Oh, bad business. How lucky I happened to be out at Norwood over another case. I was at the station when the message arrived. Now, what do you think the man died of? It's not for me to theorize. Well, we can't deny you hit the nail on the head sometimes. Thank you. I understand the door was locked. 
jewels worth half a million missing. How was the window? Fastened. But there are footprints on the sill. Well, if it was fastened, the footprints can't be anything to do with it. That's common sense. Man might have died in a fit, but then the jewels are missing. Oh, I have it. Well, just step outside, Sergeant, and you, Mr. Sholto. Oh, but I would much rather... Outside, if you don't mind. Now, Mr. Holmes, what do you think of this? Sholto confesses that he was with his brother last night. The brother died in a fit, and Sholto walked off with the treasure. How's that? On which the dead man very considerately got up and locked the door on the inside. Ah. Ah, yes. There's a flaw there. But there was a quarrel that we know. And no one saw the brother from the time Thaddeus left him. His bed hasn't been slept in. Thaddeus is evidently in a most disturbed state of mind. You see, I am weaving my web around Thaddeus. You're not in possession of the facts yet. This no? uh, splinter of wood was in the man's head. I think it's poison. Oh. There's also this paper inscribed as you see it in this curious stone-headed instrument. How does all that fit into your theory? Confirms it in every respect. Indeed. Yes, the house is full of Indian curiosities. If that splinter is poison, Thaddeus can have used it just as well as anyone else. Well, what about the bit of paper? Oh, that's just some hocus-pocus of blind, I expect. The only question is, how did he get away? Ah, ah, that... That hole in the ceiling, I imagine. There's a trap door up there leading to the roof. Well, there you are, then. The sergeant. Yes, sir. Ask Mr. Sholto to step this way. You won't need Mr. Sholto. Oh, well, what have you discovered? Mr. Sholto, it is my duty to inform you that anything you say will be taken down and used in evidence against you. I beg your pardon? I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned... In the death of your brother. Uh, Mr. Holmes, didn't I tell you? Don't trouble yourself, Mr. Sholto. I think I can engage to clear you of the charge. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theories. I'll do more, Mr. Jones. I'll make you a free present of the name and description of one of the two people who were in this room last night. The two people? His name, I've every reason to believe, is Jonathan Small. He's poorly educated, small, active, and wears a wooden stump on his right leg, which is worn away on the inner side. Oh, my dear His Mr. left boot Holmes, has a coarse... Square-toed sole with a band round the heel is a middle-aged man, sunburnt, and has been a convict, and there's a good deal of skin missing from the palm of his hand. And uh, what about the other one? Ah, he is rather a curious person. I hope before very long to introduce you to the pair of them. And now, will you excuse me, Watson, a word with you. Leaving Jones and Sholto open-mouthed, Holmes led me from the room onto the landing. We stopped at the head of the stairs out of earshot of the others. Watson, we mustn't forget about Miss Morstan. She's been with the housekeeper all this time. I was thinking of that. She oughtn't to stay in this house. Take her home, then. She lives with Mrs. Cecil Forrester in Lower Camberwell. It's not very far. Unless you're too tired. <laughs> Rather not. Good man. You can take the cab the police came in. What about you? Will you wait here? Yes, there are several things to do. Now, when you drop Miss Morstan off, go to number three, Pinchin Lane. Pinchin Lane? Where's that? On the riverside at Lambeth. The third house on the right-hand side is a bird stuffer's. Sherman is the name. Sherman? Knock the old man up and tell him with my compliments I want Toby at once. Toby? Yes, a queer mongrel, half spaniel, half lurcher. He has the most amazing power of scent. I would rather have Toby's help than the whole detective force of London. Well, how's the time? One o'clock. Hmm? So late? Well, I ought to be back by three if the horse is fairly fresh. Off you go, then. I'll see what I can learn from the old housekeeper and the Indian servant. And then I shall study the methods of the great Jones. Away at last from that stricken house, Miss Morstan burst into a passion of weeping. She has told me since that she thought me cold and distant on that journey. Uh, she little knew the struggle within me. She was weak and helpless. And yet, if the treasure was found, she would be an heiress. Was it fair? Was it honourable? that a half-pay surgeon should take advantage of an intimacy brought about by chance. The Agra treasure loomed like an impassable barrier between us. It's the big house on the right. Well, the house on the right, driver. Yes, sir. Um, have you your key? The servant must have gone to bed hours ago. Mrs. Forrester said she would wait up for me. Oh, well, it's two o'clock. Oh, 
Yes, yes, there is a light still burning. Dr. Watson, there's no need to disbelieve me. I may be only a paid governess here, but Mrs. Forrester has always treated me as an honored friend. Oh, my dear lady, please don't misunderstand me. I'm only thinking of your safety. Am I to wait, sir? What? Oh, yes, yes, I'll only be a moment. Don't let me delay you, Doctor. Miss Morrison, please allow me at least to meet this lady and explain oh, what... Oh, a... my child. Are you safe and sound? Yes, Mrs. Forrester. Oh. Uh, may I introduce Dr. Watson, who has escorted me home? Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Dr. Watson is a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Thank you, Doctor. It was I who sent her to Mr. Holmes. So I understand. I knew she would be in good hands. But the whole affair is so mysterious... Oh, pray come in, Doctor, and tell me what has occurred. No, please, you must forgive me. I have an urgent errand for Mr. Holmes. Mm -hmm. Besides, Miss Morstan is tired. She should rest at once. Shall we hear from you then, Dr. Watson? Of course, just as soon as there is any news. Perhaps you will take tea with us this afternoon. Thank you. Yes, I should like to. You promised? Faithfully. Good night, then, Doctor. And thank you for seeing me home. Good night, Miss Morstan. Uh, good night, Mrs. Forrester. Good night, Doctor. And now to Pinchin Lane, driver. Yes, sir. I stole a glance back at the two figures on the doorstep. It was a soothing glimpse of a tranquil English home in the midst of the wild, dark business that absorbed us. And then we were off again through the silent, gaslit streets. Pynchon Lane proved to be a row of shabby, two-storied brick houses in the lower quarter of Lambeth. Number three, like the rest of the street, was all in darkness. Hmm. Out. That's what I've come for. Will you get away? I'm a whimmer in his bed. I don't rub it on your head if you don't look it. I tell you, I've come to fetch a dog. Don't argue. One, two, three, and down he comes. Will you please listen? One, two... I'm from Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Why don't you say so? Half a minute... Friend of Mr. Sherlock is always welcome. Mm. Step clear of the badger, sir. He bites. Oh, oh. oh naughty, naughty. Would you take any of the gentleman? <gasps> Sick. Ah, don't worry, sir. It's only a slow worm. It ain't got no fangs and it keeps the beetles down. Someone gives it the run of the room. I see. You mustn't mind my being a little short with you, Versa. There's many a one comes down this lane just to knock me up for the devil of it. Now, what was it Mr. Sherlock Holmes wanted, sir? He wanted a dog of yours called Toby. Oh, yes. Toby lives at number seven on the left here. Mind your head, sir. No, what, sir? There's fowls in him, Rolfus. This is Toby. Ruff. All right, Toby, quiet, sir. How on earth am I going to make friends with him? Here, give him this lump of sugar. That'll win him over. Toby. Toby, good dog. Good, good Toby. The lump of sugar sealed the alliance, and Toby followed me into the cab without making any difficulties. It had just struck three when I found myself once more upon the Cherry Lodge. Holmes was standing on the doorstep with his hands in his pockets... Smoking his pipe. Ah, you have him. Good dog, then. Well, we've had an immense display of energy since you left. Athenley Jones is the arrested friend for Dios, the gatekeeper, the housekeeper, and the Indian servants. <laughs> Has he indeed? We've the place to ourselves, except for a constable upstairs. I've been amusing myself by a little roof climbing. 
Tinbato's friend left an admirable trail of creosote and broken tiles. He came down onto that water barrel. So did I. Holmes, you might have broken your neck. I reckoned if he could do it, I could. I'm glad I did. He was in such a hurry that he dropped this little case. Careful with it. Oh. More of those thorns like the one in poor Bartholomew Sholto's head. Yes. Careful, they're hellish things. But I'm delighted to have them. The chances are they're all he has. So there's less fear of finding one in your skin. Or mine. Exactly. I'd sooner face a martini bullet myself. Now, Watson, are you game for a six-mile trudge? Why, certainly. You're sure your leg will stand it? Oh, yes. Yeah, stand it. Uh... Then we'll see what Toby makes of this handkerchief. I dipped it in the creosote when I was upstairs. Here you are, old boy. Good old Toby. Smell it, Toby. Smell it. <laughs> what a comical beast. Look at the cock of his head. He might be <laughs> sniffing the bouquet of some famous vintage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough for him. Now, give me his chain. Roar! Roar! We'll see what happens. Come on, Toby. Holmes led Toby over to the water barrel. Immediately, the dog's nose was on the ground and his tail in the air, and he pattered off on the trail, straining at his leash. He led us across the grounds to a corner screened by a beech tree, where two walls joined. Ah, you see, Watson? There are several loose bricks here. The place has been used as a ladder. And look, there's the print of Timbertoe's hand. Hmm, and a fleck of blood. Yes. He tore his hand on the rope, you remember? How lucky we are there have been no heavy rain since yesterday. The scent will still lie on the road. But they've had 28 hours start. Think of all the traffic there must have been. Ah, that won't worry, Toby. Over we go. I'll climb first, and then you can hand me the dog up. My fears were soon appeased. Once in the road, Toby never hesitated or swerved, but waddled on in his peculiar rolling fashion. For clearly the pungent smell of the creosote rose high above all the other contending scents, as the dawn approached, he guided us on through the half-rural, villa-lined roads that lead to the metropolis. Holmes, I still don't see how you know so much about this wooden-legged man, whom you say is Jonathan Small. Oh, my dear boy, simplicity itself. Consider, two officers in command of a convict guard learn an important secret about some buried treasure. A map is drawn for them by an Englishman named Jonathan Small. You remember we saw the name from the chart in Captain Morrison's possession. Yes. The officers or one of them secures the treasure and brings it to England, leaving, we'll suppose, some condition under which he received it unfulfilled. Now then, why didn't Jonathan Small get the treasure himself? I have no idea. Well, it's obvious. Because he and the three associates named on the chart were convicts and couldn't get away. But that's mere speculation. Next, that letter that Major Shalto received from India, the one that gave him such a great fright. What did it tell him? That the men he'd wronged had been set free. More likely that they'd escaped, hence the shock. And what does he do then? He guards himself against a wooden-legged man, a white one. He fired at a white tradesman, you remember? <laughs> yes, indeed. There is only one white man's name on the chart. The other three are Hindus or Mohammedans. Therefore, the wooden-legged man must be Jonathan Small. All right so far? Yes, yes, that's quite clear. Good. Oh, uh, how's your leg holding out, Watson? Oh, perfectly well, thank you. Yes. Do we know any more about this mysterious other man? Well, I can tell you one thing. His footprint is unlike yours or mine. It shows each of his toes distinctly divided. Ours would be all cramped together. But what does that... Well, just bear it in mind. Ah, the morning air. Look at that one little cloud. It's like a pink feather from some gigantic flamingo. We traverse Streatham, Brixton and Camberwell. By now, labourers and dockmen were astir. Slatternly women were taking down shutters and brushing doorsteps. Rough-looking men were emerging from public houses, rubbing their sleeves across their beards after their morning wet. We were borne away through the side streets to the east of the Oval, until suddenly, at a corner, the dog Toby halted, with one ear cocked and the other drooping, the very picture of canine indecision. What the deuce is the matter with the dog? Oh, surely they didn't go off in a cab. Or in a balloon? <clears throat> oh, well, perhaps they stood here for some time. So the dog does the same. Roar! Roar! Oh, it's all right. We're off again. 
My hat! The scent must be strong. He's not even putting his nose to the ground. I think we're near the end of our journey, Watson. Look how he's tugging at the leash. He's trying to run. I'll go ahead with him, Watson. You follow on as quickly as you can manage. In the distance, I saw Holmes and Toby turn off into a large timber yard. When I arrived, Toby was sitting triumphantly on top of a large barrel on a hand trolley. The staves of the barrel and the wheels of the trolley were smeared with a dark liquid, and the whole air was heavy with the smell of creosote. <laughs> so Toby's not infallible. Well, he acted according to his lights. If you consider how much creosote is carted about London in one day, it's not surprising our trail was crossed. Oh, well, we'd better try and get on the main scent again. Yes, it must have been at that corner where he hesitated. There were two trails, obviously, and he took the wrong one. Let's go back and try our luck. Come, Toby. Good dog. Back at the corner, Toby cast about in a wide circle and then dashed off towards the riverside. He took us down to a landing stage on the water's edge. Close to it was a small brick house with a wooden placard in the window. Mordecai Smith, boats to hire by the hour or day. Steam lunch available. As we approached, the door of the house opened. And a little curly-haired boy came running out, followed by a stoutish, red-faced woman with a large sponge in her hand. Jack, you tell me, how's that to be washed? <laughs> you want some barley come out and see you like that? <laughs> oh. Oh, what a dear little chap. Is there anything you'd like, Jack? I'd like a shilling. Nothing you'd like better? Two shillings. <laughs> Here you are, then. <laughs> a fine child, Mrs. Smith. Lord bless you, sir, he is that. And forward. It's almost too much for me to manage when my man's away. Oh, well, where is he? Oh, that's a pity. I wanted to hire his steam launch. Why, sir, it's a steam launch he's gone in. That's what puzzles me. I know there ain't more coals than her that would take her to Woolwich and back. Well, he might have bought some at a walk down the river. Oh, he might, sir, but it weren't his way. Many a time I've heard him call out at their prices. Besides, I don't like that wooden-legged man. What's hmm? he always knocking about here for? Wooden-legged man? Yes, sir. Uh, brown, monkey-faced chap. My man knew he was coming because he had steam up in the launch. Was this wooden-legged man alone? Couldn't say, sir. He tapped on the window at three in the morning and my old man woke up Jim, that's my oldest, and off they went. All I heard was his wooden leg clacking on the stones. Oh, dear, what a pity. I wanted a steam launch myself, and I've heard such good reports of the, uh... The Aurora, sir. Ah, yes, of course. She's not that old green launch with the yellow line. Is she very uh, broad in the beam? Not her. She's as trim a little thing as any on the river. She's been fresh painted. Black with two red lines. Uh, two red lines. Thank you. I'm going down the river, and if I see the Aurora, I'll tell Mr. Smith you're uneasy. Uh, black funnel... You say? No, sir. White with a black band. Ah, of course. It was the sides which were black. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Smith. Good morning, sir. Hmm. Ah, there's a boatman there with a wherry, Watson. Let's take it and cross the river. The main thing with people like Mrs. Smith, Watson, is never to let them think their information is of the slightest use to you. Otherwise... They shut up like an oyster. <laughs> Very neat. <laughs> well, our course seems clear enough now. What would you do? Engage a launch and go looking for the aurora. Oh, my dear fellow, that would take you days. The river's a perfect labyrinth of landing places for miles. Hmm. Bring in the police, then? No, thank you. I have the fancy for working it out myself now that we've got so far. What are we to do, then? Take a hansom, drive home and have some breakfast and an hour's sleep. And on the way, we'll stop at the great Peter Street post office... You remember the Jefferson Hope case? Indeed, I do. Then you remember the special detective force we recruited from all the little street Arabs in the neighborhood of Baker Street? You mean you're going to use them again? That's it. I'll send a wire to Master Wiggins, their leader. If the launch is above water, they'll find her. They'll go everywhere, see everything, overhear everyone. Jonathan Small doesn't know it yet, but in a couple of hours he'll be up against the Baker Street Irregulars. That was the third episode of The Sign of Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for radio by Felix Felton. With Richard Herndl as Sherlock Holmes 
and Brian Coleman as Dr. Watson. Production is by Archie Campbell for the BBC.